Welcome to this edition of the CHDS Thesis Series. With me today is Battalion Chief Frank Lee from the New York City Fire Department. Welcome, Frank. Thanks, Heather. So, Frank, let's talk about how uh, you started your thesis and, and what the topic is about. So my topic is uh, it's saving the savable, increasing cardiac arrest survival, particularly in New York City. Uh, I started my research looking at different ways that we can uh, increase emergency response time and looking at some of the NFPA documents, 1710, 1720, which outline emergency response and, and that type of uh, um, qualifications. So that led me into looking at at a hospital cardiac arrest and the great disparity that there is from city to city. Um, and, and in addition, the great disparity there is from the um, percentage of bystander participation that there is. And that there's a correlation to if more bystanders perform CPR, there's a higher, there's a higher successful save um, rate as well. So that's what led me down that, that, that path. And this was significant to me because my, when uh, my brother was 36 years old, he suffered out of hospital cardiac arrest. And while the bystander called 911, they failed to perform the life-saving uh, procedure of CPR on my brother, and my brother passed away. Um, so th it's obviously close to home uh, in terms of the topic. Did you have any uh, challenges in collecting data for your thesis research? The data collection is a very tricky subject when it comes to cardiac arrest and the survival. There's a lot of players in it, and oftentimes data is missing or incomplete whether it's from the hospital, from the first response agency, or it's a, just a jurisdiction that doesn't collect adequate data. Um, it's data collection, without proper data collection, it's very difficult to make any recommendations, to make an improvement in anything. At a hospital, cardiac arrest is no different. The first thing that needs to happen is, is there needs to be uh, concise and accurate data reporting of every cardiac arrest. Additionally, jurisdictions have the leeway of when they report their statistics, they can exclude or include um, different parameters that, ha that can skew the data. So that was, that was a challenge in, in finding who's doing it right and looking beyond their initial data reporting to see um, what they're actually doing. And that was where we found jurisdictions that are doing it, that are doing it right. There's a couple of jurisdictions that, have, that are definitely doing it better than others. So in your thesis, you identify some barriers to um, achieving uh, optimal outcomes. Can you go over those? Sure. The, uh, the research demonstrated that there's, there's many barriers why people may not perform CPR. There's also barriers to, if they want to, for them to actually perform CPR. So we know that um, in 2008, the American Heart Association changed their recommendation to hands-only CPR. That was a significant change because one of the barriers was people didn't want to do mouth-to-mouth. -mouth. They also realized that doing chest compressions alone is, is uh, a viable mechanism of saving many lives. And then the first responders get there and they will perform you know, traditional um, CPR and defibrillation. Additionally, uh, People are afraid that they're going to get sued or, or they're going to have some type of legal action taken against them. But there's the Good Samaritan laws protect them. Many people aren't totally aware of the protections that the Good Samaritan law um, provides for them. And that's been shown in some of the research that's been done. And so you have these barriers. How do you propose to overcome them? Well, we, if we could um, train people in hands-only CPR, and we could have them better aware of the protections that Good Samaritan laws have, and then we can train them often. That would be, because one of the other things that was demonstrated is that the more often you're trained in CPR, um, that has a correlation to your, that you will perform CPR when you're needed. So somebody who's, uh, and in addition, the recency. So if you've been recently trained in CPR, or even seen an advertisement, or a public, uh, public um, uh, message about it, you're more likely to, to engage and, and help when somebody needs it. We know, we see all the time, people are willing to help. A car accident, I respond to a car accident or a, a burning building and people rush in, people are willing to help people. 
So we have to identify these barriers and overcome them and give people the proper mechanism to do that. And many of the technologies, procedures, and are already in place in certain jurisdictions. We just need to make them more widespread. So education and technology are great friends, and uh, your research shows that those increasing those will help folks become more inclined to uh, help and Absolutely. more successful outcomes. What, do you, what does the research show about outcomes for participation? Well, in, uh, in New York City, the bystander participation has generally been somewhere between 30 and 40 percent, somewhere in that range. We've seen some jurisdictions have uh, bystander participation 50, 60, 80 percent. And what we've seen is that we've seen a correlation to the survival rate in that as well. First responders cannot arrive soon enough in the time period that they need to to make a difference in how to hospital cardiac arrest. The traditional thinking has been that for every minute that elapses without CPR, that the chances of your survival decrease 7 to 10 percent. The reality is that there's been other studies that demonstrate that the first three to four minutes are critical and that a flat line lies after that. In other words, if we don't start CPR within the first four minutes, the chances of survival are almost zero. That's important because no first response agency can arrive to patients of cardiac arrest in under four minutes all the time. So we need bystanders to, to get involved, be trained, and help be part of the solution to this problem. There's a, a part of your thesis that really covers, uh, specifically to New York City, the high-rise environment and how that plays into this, this whole, um, the statistics and the research. Can you go over that? Yes, yeah, so recently in New York City, um, a building was completed. It's 96 stories. It's a residential building. Um, it's the highest residential building in the Western Hemisphere. And it's really the tip of the iceberg when we look at residential construction particularly in New York City. While that is the highest, we currently have 15 additional projects that are in some form of the construction stage that are gonna be 70 stories or more, including one in Queens that's gonna have 930 apartments in it when it's completed. Many of these are gonna be on upper floors of the building. So a retrospective study from Toronto that was released earlier this year demonstrated that survival depending on your, how far up in the building you reside, does play a part in your survival. If you live on the 16th floor, for example, the study demonstrated that you have a 0.9% chance of survival. That's below 1% chance. That's considered fruitless in, in these studies. If you lived above the 26th floor, in this five-year study, there were zero survivors of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. Now, there may be other reasons for this, and the study pointed out that there could be other reasons for this. But this has to prompt an evaluation of, of the laws and procedures that, that, govern, that govern these. So let me get this right. So currently, there's, there's no mitigation. If you live on a high rise that's above the, what, 16th floor, your, your chances of survival are very low, if not zero. Yes, uh, uh, the Toronto study pointed out that above the 16th floor, your chances of survival of a sudden cardiac arrest are very low. So please tell me that there's something, uh, some recommendations that you might have to help mitigate this. I think one recommendation is I think that we need to look at, at the codes that govern the construction of these buildings. And first, we need to make the elevators the, the proper size to, to have a... Um, to have a stretcher fit in that comfortably so the responders can work on the patient and that would, that would be helpful. But we need to do more than that. We need to change uh, AED requirements possibly that, that an AED should be in these buildings. What is AED just for everybody? That's a defibrillator, mm -hmm. uh, an automatic defibrillator that, that we need to have applied. We know that the, um, the usage rates of an AED are very low and we need to increase that as well and increasing their, um, the locations of where they are it can, can go away to do that, it can help. And we could use technology in how to find where they are as well. There's an app, that uh, a very successful app, in, that tells you where AEDs are. And what is that called? That's the Pulse Point app. And that's one of the recommendations is that um, jurisdictions should look to implement Pulse Point or similar type of um, 
location enabling apps. So how that works is that somebody suffers a cardiac arrest in a public location. They, when it, they, somebody calls 911, it notifies the responders. It simultaneously notifies people trained in CPR who are within, who are within a similar geographic area. So they can start to do CPR um, before the first responders arrive. Excellent idea. Now, did, were there other countries that have certainly have high rises? Did you have any research that showed um, any uh, good practices, smart practices from from there? Other than the Toronto study, I didn't find um, other uh, cities around the around the world that were doing it um, any differently than us. Everybody seems to struggle with the same or similar problems of at a hospital uh, cardiac arrest. So this is a frontier of. Um, uh, importance because in the city planning, it seems like our cities are getting so big and so populous that their their answer is to go up, but we're not having the codes and things to keep up with the technology. Yes, and it's possible that apps can be developed specific for buildings. Building personnel can be trained in CPR. They could be notified to respond within a building and basically have these micro communities, maybe just a, a single building where they have a procedure where the, the, front, the, the, the person who's at the front desk responds, or they have similar policies or laws that high-rise office buildings have, and they have um, different, different personnel on duty 24 hours a day. These are different things that can, that can help get somebody to the location faster because first responders can't arrive soon enough to save the lives, to save all of the lives that they can. Do you have anything to add in terms of your recommendations uh, at the end of your thesis research? I think the, the, the major takeaway from my thesis is that um, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit that we can make improvements on no matter where you are, whether you're in New York City or anywhere else in the country. While it's true, the high-rise component of my thesis has a, a limited uh, value to, to cities or in municipalities that do not have high rise. The other recommendations is a lot of low hanging fruit that doesn't cost a lot of money to implement and that can show immediate increases in your out of hospital cardiac arrest survival. And the bottom line is uh, the first responders, they can't arrive soon enough to save everybody. And without a proper message of we need the bystanders to help without them getting involved, without proper training, utilizing the technology that's available already. Um, without that, when it's very difficult to increase the levels of uh, survivability in uh, at a hospital cardiac arrest. Well, you did some amazing research on a, on a topic that really needed help uh, getting national visibility. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me. Thank you.